So user authentication is different from message authentication in slight few ways. For example, users have thumbs and, no, and, and eyes and messages don't. So we can authenticate you by things and different than the message. So here we will talk about four or five different things. First of all, how do you authenticate a user using secret keys and two systems that are used are Kerberos 4 and Kerberos 5. Then we talk about how to authenticate using public keys and then federated identity management, which means that you know you you are authenticated here, but you can use it over there, some other place. So the thing about users is that we can authenticate them by something that they know. Just like your pin and password, which is the common method. Or something that you have, which is like some people have those token things, you know, that they have, you know, we can authenticate that, yeah, you are you, if you have that credit card. Our biometrics, which is fingerprints, our iris, are something that you do, such as speak or sign, right? So these are all four possibilities, and, um, and all have some issues or the other, right? For example, biometrics do not always work. I mean, you know, for example, I have now we, we have this fingerprint thing reader on almost every computer. Uh, my computer has a fingerprint reader, but some days it doesn't work because my finger had a scratch or something like that. Right? So I have to go back to password. Um, so and and the tokens can be lost, credit cards can be lost, and the voice can change if you have a cold. And so. So you, sometimes people use two of them. So I've seen people who work for, for example, a friend of mine works for RSA, so he always carries this thing, you know, the smart card, and then um, obviously he has a password, and maybe he, I don't know whether they look at his iris also. So you know, there are several things they use in combination. But second thing is that the authentication could be one way or mutual. And it's interesting. When we started all this security stuff, it was always one-way authentication. So the users identified to the bank, and the banks didn't authenticate to the user. It was not felt necessary. The users identified to the base station, and a Wi-Fi base station, but the base station did not authenticate to the user. Now you can see what problem that can cause, right? A fake bank can come in and say, okay, log in, please give me username and password. Right? And you never know that this is a fake bank or the real bank. Right? So now they have started bank authentication. You know how they do bank authentication? By flashing a picture which you selected before when you signed up for the account. If that picture matches, then you know this is the bank. Has anybody seen that picture? Right? That is the bank authentication part. Because if I create a fake bank, I don't know your picture, the picture that you selected. You selected an elephant and I show you a dog, you know that is not, this is not the bank. <laughs> right? So be careful with that picture. Make sure that this is the picture that you selected. All right? That's the bank authentication. And your authentication is the password. And so you don't put your password until you see the bank's picture. And that's a two-step process nowadays. So it could be one way or mutual. And in some cases, it has to be one way, like email. If I send you something, it is only one way. I mean, you know, I'm going to send it to you, and hopefully it will reach you. And um, when you get it, then you will be want to know whether it came from Professor Jain or somebody else sent it. So it is only one way, the sender authentication. Right? If the receiver is wrong, then hopefully I would have done it in such a way that nobody else can read it. All right, so it can be, what kind of attacks can be? There we, first is replay attacks. And this is not a complete list again, but it is an example list. Somebody could simply replay things if there is no timestamp. They could just play the message again and again and again, and it will look like the original message. If it is timestamped, but if the timestamp allows you an error of five minutes, somebody could play it within five minutes. Or somebody could replace the original message with a new message or somebody could play it back to the source so source sends a message which is encrypted with a session key now the attacker doesn't know the session key but it sends it back to the source and source gets a message which is encrypted with the session key and it decrypts it and 
unless the source is really dumb, so figure it out that it is going from me to them and not them to me. But in some cases, it could be confusing. So those are some examples, another exhaustive list of kind of replays. And so some of the things that we people, people can do is put the sequence numbers. So most of these times you will have nonsense so that we can match, yeah, that this is the request, uh, this is the response to that same request and so on and so forth. Uh, we will have timestamps so that if we get it again, but the timestamps are a problem. We need synchronized clocks and the clocks are not synchronized. And the third thing is <coughs> challenge response. Oh yeah, first is sequence number, second is nonsense. So sequence numbers are, um, are kind of not reliable because cra computers crash and we forget the sequence number. So it's just better to use random number, which is nonce. All right, so the whole field started with Needham Schroeder protocol. And um, Needham and Schroeder came up with this idea that we should have a KDC and each user registers with the KDC, just like we did before. And so it says, hi, I am A, I want to talk to B, my nonce is N1. And this all goes in clear. Now everybody has registered with KDC, so A has registered with KDC, and KDC knows A is, is a key. And so it sends a message which is encrypted. So this was the notation we used last time. Encrypted with what key? A is key, KA. And inside the encrypted field, we have KS, ID A, ID of A, ID of B, your number N1. Then another encrypted message, which is encrypted with KB, right? B's key, and that has a KS session key and the ID of A. All right, so this whole Okay, so these are not two, I'm sorry, this is not inside encryption, let's see. If I read it carefully, these are two encrypted messages side by side, not one inside the other. There could be one inside the other, but the one inside the other is, is less desirable because you have to encrypt a lot many more words than, than, you know, you have double encryption. Right, so double encryption is a negative. So anyways, here it is one be aside the other anyway so then once a gets it it can decrypt this thing it can decrypt what it can decrypt only the first part it cannot decrypt the second part so what it does is it sends the second part to b as it is it doesn't know how to read it but it sends it the whole part to b this is called a ticket this is like a theater ticket once you have it you can show it to the gatekeeper which in this case is b and B can decrypt it and know that the session key is S and this is coming from A. So it can say that, okay, prove me that you are A by sending a nonce N2. If this is really A, then it should know the KS by now, the session key, and it can send it back N2 or some function of N2 and um, prove that, yeah, it is A. So now both of them know KS. So this is very strong, except that after the paper was published, some people said, well, there is an attack. And that attack is that somebody can replay three. So we have a ticket and we can use it again. The only problem will be that what if um, N2 is, um, so it sends an N2, it will, it, will get the, it will get this thing. And then B will send some other N2 it will not be sent to A, it will block, and then it will um, somehow be able to act as A, and I don't understand how it can find KS though. But uh, there is a problem here that um, um, if it replace three, block four, uh, here is my nonce, it has to know KS somehow. So I think the assumption here was that if um, someone can crack KS, one KS, any KS, then it can replay that particular ticket many, many times, even though it doesn't know KB. Because to respond here, all you need to do is KS. Whatever N2 comes back, it doesn't go to A, it goes to C, or the, or the attacker, 
and they can figure out N2 and then return N2, whatever needs to be returned. So then they can start acting like A from that point onwards, just by knowing one S, one KS. So then two people did modification. First person was Denning, and Denning said we will put the time stamp, and um, that fixes it. However, um, the problem with the time stamps needs synchronized clocks, which are not possible. So somebody else fixed it, and they put a nonce along with the time stamp. And so the, now the time stamps can be loser. But loser means, you know, lose. You know, they don't have to be very tight. Um, and so now this is the final, um, final, um, these four messages, actually. one, two, three, four. This is the final protocol. So let's start with the first. Here it says, hi, I am A, my nonce is an A. This goes in clear to B. B goes to KDC and says, hey, A wants to talk to me, and uh, the time is TB. And it sends um, this NA and IDA encrypted with its key to KDC as well as clear. Then KDC sends to A directly. So say a step there, KDC sends to B and then B sends to A. So KDB, KDC sends to A directly the, the KS and uh, the time and um, N A is the, the, the nonce and then B is nonce and then A will have to respond back to B with its nonce and, and, and so that to prove that yeah I got it and I know you know that I am A. Alright? So now even though there are time stamps T B but it could be half by an hour or something but as long as N A and B match it's fine. And then they had an optimization where once this thing expires, we don't have to go to KDC to find another KS. Just before the KS expires, we can talk to each other and get the next KS. By here, the previous ticket from KDC with my new nonce, you give a new number, N prime A. And then it gives you new number here, and then it returns the new number there. It returns the previous number, N A prime here, and this one returns N B prime there. So by that handshake, they can each re-authenticate again and then use a new key. For, for um, email, if you want to use this scheme for email, which is one way, and uh, we assume that B is not up. When we are sending the email, B may not be up. A is sending to B. So it says, hi, I am A. I want to send an email to B. My nonce is N1. So it says ID A, ID B, and N1. Then, um, KDC could send the session key, KS, and a ticket. Now this ticket looks like double encrypted. I don't see any reason for double encryption, but as I stated here, it is double encrypted. So the nonce comes back that proves that this is not a replay. And um, this ticket is in somehow extracted by using KA. And then the ticket and the message is sent to B. So this message is encrypted with KS and that KS is encrypted with the KB. And right, so the message has both the key and the message, I mean encrypted message. So because it's encrypted with KB. By the way, every time I use a single letter subscript for keys, that means that is the secret that B has registered with the KDC. Okay, so KB is the secret that B has registered with KDC. That is the key, that is the master key for B. And similarly, KA is the master key for A, these are all pre-registered, and after that they will use KS, the session key. This modification was important, the bottom modification, because we, see I was going to say that we use less master keys, but we use only one less master key, because we are still using KB, we are not using KA anywhere here. So, you know, there is less use of KA, the less master keys you use, better it is, rather than going through the original process, which has two problems, not only that you need KA, but you also need KDC to be up. So that brings us to an interesting system called Kerberos.